What's up everybody and welcome back to another video on the SAT from the Scalar Learning Channel. This is a video that I've been wanting to make for a very long time so I'm very happy to finally present to you everything that you need to know about the SAT. Without further ado, let's do it. First, let's talk about the history of the SAT. The SAT began as something called the Army Alpha Test. This was developed during World War I to test Army recruits. In 1926, it was adapted by Carl Brigham for college admissions. At this time, it was said to measure thinking skills you'll need to succeed in college and career. In 1933, it was used by Harvard University to award scholarships for students coming from outside of standard boarding schools. It wasn't until 1943 that the SAT became the standard for college admissions. By 1957, it was administered to over half a million students. In 2005, the scoring system was changed from a 1600 max to a 2400 max. And finally, the test was redesigned once again in 2016 to go back to a 1600. Now that we've looked at some of the history of the SAT, let's look at the modern SAT. So the modern SAT is comprised of four sections, the first of which is the evidence-based reading. This section is 65 minutes and contains five passages with a total of 52 questions. The topics covered in the passages are science, literature, history, and social science. Next we have the writing section. The writing section is 35 minutes with four passages and 44 questions. There are a lot of topics, so I'm just gonna present the list as follows. One thing about the writing section is it's all about mechanics. So it's similar to the math section in that there are a number of rules that need to be memorized in order to succeed here. Section three is a math section where no calculator is allowed. This section is 25 minutes and contains 20 questions. And the broad topics here are Heart of Algebra, Passport to Advanced Mathematics, Problem Solving and Data Analysis, and Additional Topics in Math. Finally, Section 4 is a math section as well, but this one, Calculator, is allowed. This is a lengthier section where 55 minutes is allotted to complete 38 questions. The topics covered here include, again, Heart of Algebra, Passport to Advanced Mathematics, Problem Solving and Data Analysis, and Additional Topics in Math. So why should you take the SAT? Well, there are two primary reasons. First and foremost, it is a major admissions criteria to many universities. Now, of course, this has changed quite a bit in the last few years, but I do want to note that there's an important second reason. The SAT can afford possible scholarship opportunities. So first, let's talk about how the SAT is used for admissions. And what we're going to do is we're going to go over some basic statistics pulled from US News and World Report that look at standard zones for SAT scores when choosing to admit students at a few different universities. First, we have Princeton University, which is ranked as the number one school in the country. And their 25th to 75th percentile score score is 1460 to a 1570 composite score. So that's the middle 50%. So of course we have people below that score and above that score, but that's the middle 50%. For the University of Michigan, my alma mater, which is ranked number 24, the 25th to 75th is a 1340 to a 1530. Jumping further down the line in the rankings, we have University of Georgia, which is ranked 47th, and they take a 1240 to a 1420 for that middle range. The University of Arizona ranked 97th, has 1110 to 1360 for that interquartile range. Oregon State University ranked at 153rd has an interquartile range for the SAT of 1080 to 1320. The University of Wyoming ranked 196 has 1060 to 1280. For the last two schools, we have William Carey University ranked 272nd with a 25th to 75th percentile of 950 to 1180. And finally, Delaware State University, which has a ranking of 284th, has a 25th to 75th percentile of 820 to 1020. So as you can see, as we move down the rankings for these schools, the range of acceptable scores does indeed drop. Now let's talk about the SAT for scholarships. So of course there are a plethora of scholarships that you can qualify for. I've just pulled a few from a few specific universities just to give you an idea of what's possible based on your SAT score. Here's some interesting examples where we're talking about both a requirement of the SAT score as well as the GPA. But as you can see from this table, you can get anywhere from $5,000 to $15,000 per year. Next, let's talk about how to register for the SAT because of course if you can't 
register for it, can't take it. All you have to do is go to this website, log in, create an account, and you'll be able to register for your SAT. Just remember, you will need a valid photo ID on test day. Next, let's talk about when the SAT is offered per year. So in general, the SAT is offered seven times per year. These dates include times in March, May, June, August, October, November, and December. Just a quick note, if you are trying to apply early to certain schools, October may be the deadline, but check with each particular school for specific details. Now let's talk about the best test day, because I get this question all the time. When is the best time for me to take the SAT? Well, here's the answer. It depends on when you're ready. There's lots of theories about the worst test date and the best test date based on the curve. We're gonna talk about all of that, but in the end, all you wanna think about is take that test when you're ready. You will have multiple opportunities to take it, and we're gonna talk about that later as well, but take it when you're ready and you've done the careful preparation that needs to get done. Next, let's address something that people always talk about, which is, is the SAT curve? So the short answer is no, but you do wanna bear in mind that sometimes a certain number correct will give you one score, and on later dates, it can give you a different score. So why is that? So first of all, what is a curve? A curve is something that is applied after the fact, meaning you see how students do, and then you scale the scores accordingly according to how everybody does on that particular test day. That's not what happens on the SAT. The College Board instead uses a process called equating. Equating is a predetermined scaling of scores based on perceived difficulty of the test. This is so that a score in 2019 can be accurately compared to a score in 2020. The important thing to remember is that the scaling of scores therefore occurs before anybody sits to take it. Why am I emphasizing this point? Because this means it does not matter who else takes the test on your test date. So many times I've heard college counselors incorrectly state that August, for example, is a bad test date because it's the most competitive. Well, in fact, that's completely not true. And if they would just read the College Board website, they would see that. Instead, the curve will be more gentle if the test is considered to be a more difficult test and vice versa. What I generally say is you actually want a harder test. so You have a gentler curve and a little bit more leeway in terms of getting questions wrong to still get your target score. Now I want to go over some data that will show you how the difficulty of these tests is dispersed throughout the months. So for example here, you'll see the difficulty go from easiest to hardest, which means on the right hand side, the curves are actually the nicest. Case in point, you see the March 2018 exam being one of the hardest tests administered. And then you also see March 2019 being on the easier side. My point is, is that it's difficult to associate a particular test date with the difficulty of the test. We see something similar with the SAT reading section. As you can see, the dates are sort of spread across and there's not a real pattern as to when the hardest or easiest tests are given. Finally, here's a distribution of the writing curves. Here you will see one interesting thing, which is that the May test seems to have some of the harder sections, but I don't believe that's enough data to draw a conclusion that Mays are generally harder for the writing section. Another question that I get asked all the time is how many times should I take the SAT? Well, according to the College Board, you should take it at least twice, which I do agree with, but I'm gonna take it up one level and say you should take it at least three times. The only caveat to this is if you reach your target score sooner, hey, you can bow out if you wanna focus on other things. Now, when you do take it multiple times, you wanna know what the colleges are gonna look at. So, colleges will either take your highest score only, a super score, which means take the highest sections across all attempts. So for example, if you got an 800 in math on your first test attempt, but a 630 for the verbal section, but then the second time you take it, you get a 780 on the verbal section and a 630 on the math section, they'll take the highest math, the highest verbal, and make a super score. Lastly, colleges might ask to see all of your scores. Now to see the full list of colleges and what they ask for and what they're looking at, you can go to this URL, which will of course be in the description link below. But just a quick note, many, many super reputable schools do indeed take your super score. Now let's talk about the cost. So how much does it cost to take the SAT? So here are a list of all of the costs associated with the SAT, but the main cost to notice is that SAT registration is $55. Another Another really important one is the change registration fee of $25. Last but not least, the question and answer service of $16 is extremely important because I highly recommend everybody taking an SAT where this is available that you buy it so that you can look at every question that you got wrong, do some analysis and improve as such. Now let's talk about what you should bring on your SAT test day. First and foremost, three number two pencils all fully sharpened, a handheld pencil sharpener in case you do need to sharpen one of them, a healthy snack that is low 
in sugar and high in protein, a silent watch that has no alarm or anything like that that can go off in the middle of the test, plenty of water so you can stay hydrated, a comfortable mask if one is required, a calculator with fresh batteries, extra batteries just in case the batteries die, and of course your admission ticket. Now in terms of College Board approved calculators, what do they accept? There's quite a few on the list, so I'm gonna throw them up here and we're gonna go through them generally. So first, here are all the Casio approved calculators, and then we also have Texas Instruments. Most of my students tend to use a Texas Instrument calculator, but of course, whatever you have that's on this list will do the job perfectly well. We also have options from Sharp, Hewlett Packard, Radio Shack, and of course, a few other brands. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, please click that like button. And if you want more information on the SAT from the Scalar Learning Channel, make sure to click subscribe. Thank you guys so much for joining, and I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy.